A few years ago, I created an educational programming language I call Pigeon. And the core idea of Pigeon was that semantically, it's a language that's stripped down. It's taking all of the mainstream languages and distilling them down to their common elements. So you strip out all the conveniences, all the things that are particular to one language over another. And what you're left with are you have functions, you have control flow with uh, if and while and, and loop constructs, you have variables, you have um, operations and function calls, of course, and local variables and global variables. And that's about it. Aside from that, there's the question of whether you're going to be statically typed or dynamically typed. And for various reasons, I think dynamic typing is easier for a newcomer. It uh, simplifies a few things. And so Pigeon is dynamically typed, and we have five basic data types, numbers, strings, booleans, lists, and maps. And that's it. Also, the language simplifies things by not having any kind of module system or, or packages or whatever you want to call them. So you just have a single source file of code for every program. You don't even have any kind of standard libraries. And so the only facility for input and output in this whole language is that there are two built-in operators. So there's the print operator and the prompt operator. So you can spit text out to console and you can read text from console, but that's all you can do in this language input and output wise, which is fine for the context of a reductively simple educational language. Also for simplicity, unlike um, more conventional dynamic languages, like say a JavaScript or a Python, your top level definitions aren't ordered because they're not really executed statements. They're just things in no particular order and execution kicks off with a function called main. So that's the language semantically. That's really all you need to know. And then syntactically, Pigeon does three important things for the sake of learners. First off, it's indentation sensitive. And so like Python, we don't have curly braces or anything. You just, from indentation, uh, the language knows what's part of what, what body is part of what statements and what uh, function definitions, etc. Whether you prefer that in a real language or not, I think is beside the point. For learners, it definitely is simpler. I see it a lot. Learners really do get tripped up uh, very early on with just deciding where to put their curly braces, getting weird uh, error messages because they forgot to put one in, etc. It's kind of a pain. So it's just better to enforce indentation like Python. The second important thing Pigeon does syntactically is that all of the operations and function calls are in prefix notation. So you have a pair of parentheses, you have the name of the function or the name of the operator, and then you have all the operands or arguments uh, separated by spaces, no commas. And be clear, this doesn't mean that this is a Lisp dialect. In a Lisp dialect, everything is an S expression, but we have a traditional statement-based uh, syntax. It's just that for our operations under function calls, those are in prefix notation. And the virtue of prefix notation was a couple of virtues. One is that there's no sense of order of precedence. Visually, it's entirely uniform. That's really important. You're not limited to just having one or two operands per operation. So you sidestep a lot of stuff that really is problematic for people right out of the gate. The third thing, the last thing that Pigeon does that's very important syntax-wise is all of the operator names are reserved words, not symbols. So for example, the arithmetic operators are ADD for addition, SUB for subtraction, MUL for multiplication, and DIV for division, MOD for modulus. This does make the code more verbose, but again, it's much more uniform for learners because this means that all of your operations look like function calls and vice versa, and it's driving home this commonality that they're, they're both these expressions, these things that take input values and return output values, maybe with side effects, drives home that commonality by making them look exactly the same. Uh, generally also, for like an operator that's totally new to you and has no analog to something you already know, um, it's much easier to remember a word, even an abbreviated word, rather than an arbitrary symbol. So that's everything about Pigeon, semantically and syntactically. It's something that can be taught to people who have no programming experience whatsoever in, well, the mechanics can be explained in less than an hour. My video is like 45 minutes. And then beyond that, you would want to lead them through a few demos and a few exercises. And that's another, say, like four, five, six hours tops. So this, this whole undertaking of learning this language can very, very easily be done in a day of instruction. And very importantly, in that day, you learn the entirety of the language, absolutely everything about it, which is not something you can say at all about any real language, even the ostensibly simpler ones. Like there's dark corners lurking in, in really any real language. That's the problem with real languages. Let me give you just a quick example of Pigeon code. Here's a program with a main function at the bottom, uh, a function called sum with a parameter nums, 
Notice parameters are not in parentheses. You just, if you have parameters, there are extra names after the name of the function, which is a little weird at first, but that's important because it means that parentheses in this language consistently always mean exactly the same thing. You don't have the usual confusion of like, oh, is that parentheses for, are they optionally there for controlling precedence? Is it there because this is a parameter list or is it because this is an argument list of a function or, you know, all the different uses of parentheses in conventional syntax. So anyway, small detail there. Um, we have a global variable called message at the top. It's being initialized to an empty string um, inside the sum function. All the local variables of your function are declared with a local statement at the top. This has two local variables, total and I. We don't specify the types, it's a dynamic language. As is an assignment statement. So we're assigning here to the variable total, the value zero. By default, total had the value nil, now it'll have the value zero. And then a for inc loop. Uh, originally I didn't have any convenience loops whatsoever. Um, we just had while, but then that made code examples really verbose and ugly in a distracting way. And so I added in, instead of conventional for, we have a for each loop, uh, but then we also have a thing I invented called for inc and for deck, where here this is specifying this counter variable i, it's initialized to, oh, geez, I have a mistake in the code. Uh, let me correct this. There we go. I added in a zero. Anyway, this for inc loop has a counter variable i that starts out with the value zero, and it is incremented each time to the loop up to the value that is len of nums. So once we reach len of nums, that's when we break out a loop. So we'll go up to that value, but not including. Uh, and then in the body of the loop, we have an assignment to the variable total, taking the current value of total, adding it to the value at index i of nums. The way you access an element of array is with the get operator. And so this code is going to accumulate in total the value of all the elements of nums. And then once we're through the loop, we print out a message and we're going to return the value of total. That's what this function does. And then in the main function, we have a single local variable n. We then assign to the global variable message, the string hi world. And we call sum, uh, the list operator creates a list in this case with three initial elements, five, three, and eight in that order. We pass in that to sum, we get back the sum of five, three, and eight. So that should be uh, 16. And then we print out n, which should be 16. So that's an example of pigeon code. If you know any mainstream language, you should have no trouble following that. If you're new to programming, don't worry, I'll explain it in other videos. Now, however, there's a problem with pigeon, and that is that it's very simple and it introduces people very quickly to the core concepts of, of programming or mainstream languages, at least without a lot of distractions, stripping out those distractions. But the learner then wants to move on and learn a real programming language, but there's still quite this large gap between what they learn in Pidgin and then what they need to learn in any real language. Because again, there's all these dark corners in any real language, weird details, annoying distractions, which really does add up. In itself, none of it's rocket science, but these things add up and, and make them hard to learn. So ideally what we want is we want something that bridges the gap between what you learn in Pidgin and then what you're going to learn in the real programming language that you want to learn, whether that's JavaScript, Java, C, Go, whatever. The problem is how you fill in that gap is going to differ based on what the language is. So I've already worked out a language which I call GoPigeon, which is building on the semantics of Pigeon, extending it with Go semantics to teach you Go. Uh, because, well, for various reasons, I think Go is the best first real language that people should learn these days. It has some unique virtues. Um, number one, it's a relatively clean language compared to most anything out there. It's not a perfect language by any means, but relatively it is simple. I like the documentation. It's easy to read, easy, I think, for newcomers to understand. A lot of things about it are good for newcomers. Um, and also, it's uniquely setting people up for going in different directions. So if you learn Go, and then you can next learn C and C++, and you've already, to a great extent, understood the concept of pointers if you learn Go, even though it is a garbage-collected language and you don't do point arithmetic in Go, you're still, you still have a leg up. I think it uh, eases you into that, that kind of programming. But then Go also sets you up, I think, very well for learning uh, the higher level languages, the, the web languages, if, if you want to call them that, things like JavaScript and Java and Python, etc. So that's the first pigeon hybrid language which I created. And what that looks like is uh, it's not everything semantically about Go. It does have static typing. Type systems a bit simplified. We just have instant floats and bytes, unsigned integers of 8 bits. Um, but we don't have the other stuff because we don't, you know, we're trying to strip things down a bit. We do have multi return functions. We have structs, we have methods, pointers, interfaces, um, type switch, which is not the term they use in Go, but it's a, you, you have an interface and you want to switch over uh, different cases of what the type is. That's why you call it a type switch. You have arrays and slices, you have function variables, 
And then I've added in file operators. So again, we still don't have any kind of module system. We don't have packages like in real Go, um, but we want to be able to do something a little bit more interesting. So I added in uh, a few operators for opening, reading, and writing files, which uh, is a little bit odd, yes, but it gets the job done. It's a little strange, of course, to have that stuff in the form of operators, but it works. So here's that previous program translated over into GoPigeon. Uh, what's different here primarily is now we have type information for our variables. We have to specify the types uh, after the name in the style of Go. Uh, and then for our functions, we're also specifying types for the parameters and also what the return type is. So that's uh, some function, for example, the nums parameter has type i as an integer. Colon is the beginning of the return types. In this case, we're returning just one kind of thing, an integer. Notice the local variable total, also we have to specify its type. And then also in our for inc loops and for dec loops and for each loops, I also insist that you always specify the type, even though in this case, i is always going to be an integer, but I make you write it anyway, just for uniformity. And the last thing different here is down at the bottom where we create a list of strings. Oops, that shouldn't be a list of strings. I have another mistake in my code, let me fix that. There we go, I corrected this. It was a list of strings, but now it says it's a list of integers. So unlike a dynamic pigeon, because we have different types of lists, and arrays and, and slices and all those sorts of things, we have to parameterize them. And this is the syntax for parameterizing them. You, you have angle brackets after the core type, which is list. And this is a list of integers. And then we specify these values, integer values five, three, and eight. Anyway, so that's a quick and dirty example. There's quite a bit we actually leave out, a lot of details, um, the full set of base types. Of course, the syntax is different. Um, we don't have any inferred typing, no colon equals sy uh, syntax, no subscoping in your functions, your, your function is just one single scope. So all your variables get declared at the top at a in a local statement, as I call it. No go routines or channels. I did have those in originally and also had nested functions cl and closures and method values and method expressions. I was trying to be more complete originally and I actually implemented that stuff. The issue wasn't that the mechanisms themselves are all that complicated. It's more that I couldn't really, in the context of very, very small demo programs, uh, sufficiently demonstrate these features. Like I could explain them, give you tiny little, art, very, very artificial examples, but that we couldn't go into any really practical stuff because, you know, multi-threading concurrency gets immediately into a lot of complicated stuff. So best to save that for real go. Uh, and then for nested functions and closures, similar deal. The, the mechanism's not super complicated. It's a little weird conceptually perhaps, but it's not complicated really. Uh, but again, I couldn't really properly justified in the context of, a, of tiny programs that are never going to be more than like a few hundred lines. So I dropped that stuff from the language. Uh, and then we don't have, well, we do have panics in the sense that certain operations give you an error, but we don't have any means to recover from them. And we don't have defer either. Uh, we don't have variadic functions or return parameters. Those are mostly stylistic niceties we don't really need. We don't have struct and interface embedding, const iota, go to or labels. Uh, nobody would have bitwise operators or compound assignment operators. And again, we don't have packages. So of course we don't have the Go standard library. So you learn Go Pigeon. It takes another, well, once you already know Pigeon, learning Go Pigeon is probably just another hour, at least in terms of explaining the, the mechanics, but uh, actually demonstrating them and, and going through exercises, you could spend a bit more time because you can do a bit more substantial stuff in this language because we can work with files. So let's say it's like two days of material and then after those two days, you should learn the real Go. And at first, that's mostly just a matter of translating one-to-one -one into the different style of syntax. But then, of course, you'll have to cover Go routines, channels, and nested functions and closures and, and a few other odds and ends. So Go Pigeon doesn't do all of the heavy lifting, but it does a lot of it. Here's what currently the GitHub project page for Pigeon looks like. Um, there's some instructions on installation usage. There's not much to know there. Um, and there's some reference information here you might want to look at, some notes. I'm still working on this stuff. It's work in progress. And I also have some videos, which I'll put links to on this page as well, uh, once I put them up. Just understand that at the time of making this video, at least, there's some odds and ends I'm, I'm still working on. And in general, the whole thing needs more testing. I, I didn't do any kind of formal testing on this project. Probably should have. It's a pretty good candidate for that, but I didn't. Um, I also should work on better error messages. The error messages that are there aren't terrible. Um, but they can always be better. That's very important, particularly for a learner's language. I'm going to add in at some point a debug statement. I did have a, a weird debug system already where you can actually set breakpoints, but I, I stripped that whole thing out, but I'll add it back in where you actually put a debug statement where you want to have a break. Um, I'm considering adding in a special get and set syntax. I'll have to think about that one. The real motivation there is not because I think GoPigeon really needs it, but because 
I'm also working on C Pigeon and JS Pigeon, and I'm thinking about doing Java Pigeon. And in those languages, particularly JS Pigeon, uh, you do a lot of get operations in your JavaScript code. So I'm thinking about adding in some special syntax. And if I do it in that language, I want to make it uniform across the different Pigeon dialects. Um, the videos as I have them are currently just a, a rough draft. You'll, you'll notice that because I was making them as I was developing the language, there are some things that just outright changed. So if there's some discrepancy in what you see in the videos, uh, just know that what's in the on the GitHub page in the references, that's the authoritative version of, of the language as it currently stands. So it's not huge things, but just some little minor things. And the last big missing piece, and probably actually really the most important, is I just need to develop more demos and exercises to walk people through once I teach them the language. I have some stuff, but it's always good to have more of those. So if you're a programmer and you teach programming or just interested in programming education and you'd like to contribute in some way, uh, you can make comments to me on Twitter uh, or you can go to the GitHub page and, and leave some uh, some messages there. Um, and if you're a student, likewise, uh, first place I would look is on Twitter. Also the YouTube videos, uh, you can leave comments there as well.